Okay. Uh, last year at this conference, someone from the back of the room came up to me and said that they were taking bets on how long it would take me to mention Lincoln, <laughs> even though my topic had nothing to do. So, so by my accounting, it took about five seconds. So if you're, so if you're still making that bet, that's uh, yeah. Yeah. what I'm going to talk about. You know, is uh, I want to start out talking about the uh, uh, dollar hegemony, one of the, the link between dollar hegemony and foreign policy. I thought I, I could have something to say about that. And I, read acro I ran across last week uh, one of my favorite publications by the Council on Foreign Relations uh, in, a, in a, an article called The Future of Dollar Hegemony. In a, and it, this was from August 22nd, 2023. And it says this, the dollar's global hegemony gives the U.S. government power to impose crippling sanctions and wage other forms of financial welfare against adversaries. And it's like they're celebrating it. You know, yay, that's, that's a good thing. In 2022, more than 12,000 entities were under sanction by the Treasury Department, a more than 12-fold increase since the turn of the century. U.S. sanctions do ensure that targeted adversaries pay a significant price for continuing to engage in actions the United States government opposes. <laughs> okay. It reminded me of uh, one of my favorite bumper stickers that I saw a couple of years ago. There was an American flag on it, and it said, do as we say, or we will bring democracy to your country. <laughs> and, that, and that's in... And, 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 and of course, sanctions are a major tool for this. But, you know, politicians are such that you, you can't come out and say, we're going to destroy your economy unless you let us confiscate the sugar crop for the benefit of the, the Florida sugar corporations. Or you, you can't, you have, you, have to, you have to come up with some sort of morality tale about uh, how exceptional, morally exceptional you are. Protectionists can't come and say, well, we, we're going to just uh, raise prices uh, because uh, we want our political benefactors, the people who finance our political careers, to be able to plunder you as their customers. You can't come out and say that. Uh, you can't say things like General Smedley Butler, the Marine Corps general who wrote this, uh, the famous little essay, War is a Racket. He's said to be the most highly decorated uh, Marine Corps uh, officer in American history. It's sort of the World War I era. He said, he said, you can't say this. He said it. But, you know, politicians know you can't say these things. He said, I spent most of my time in, in the Marine Corps for decades being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and for the bankers. I helped make Mexico safe for American oil interests. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a de decent place for the National Citibank. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests. And this is after his career, he's retired. He was a two-time Medal of Honor winner and all that. And he's decided late in life, this is what I did. This is what I spent my life uh, doing. And so you, you can't say that. You have to come up with some sort of morality tale. And that's where, uh, why I use the language of American exceptionalism. And, and here's where I get back to Lincoln, of course. <laughs> I, call, I call this the mother of all government lies. Uh, in 1960, Life magazine invited Robert Penn Warren, the famous novelist, to write a book on this, about the centennial of the Civil War. And uh, in war, so he wrote a book called The Legacy of the Civil War. Very interesting book, I highly recommend it. You know, it's written by one of the greatest American novelists ever, Robert Penn Warren. And one of the, one of the things that really stands out in this, in this book of his is he talks about the one effect of the Civil War was, uh, he says that the U.S. government claimed to have a treasury of virtue. He says, he calls it this, I'm quoting him, a plenary indulgence for all sins, past, present, and future. The government emerged so full of righteousness that there is enough overplus stored in heaven to take care of all the small failings and oversights of the descendants of the Crusaders. I guess the Crusaders was the Union Army, Sherman and the people like that. And he says, a moral narcissism fueled the Crusades of 1917 and 1918, American intervention in World War I, and 1941 to 1945, and our diplomacy of righteousness 
with the slogan of unconditional surrender and universal rehabilitation for others, not for us. We don't need to be rehabilitated. We're already perfect. But, but for others, yeah, we will bring democracy to your country. Okay. And then he said, the effect of this conviction of virtue is to make us lie automatically. And so, you know, all, all governments are empires of lies, but this is the unique American uh, uh, method of, of uh, institutionalized lying. And then he goes on to say that you must, to, to believe this, this treasury of virtue, you have to forget about a lot of history. You can, and he goes down, he has a whole list of things. Congress declared that the war was not about slavery. The Republican platform of 1860 pledged everlasting protection of slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation freed no one because it only applied to rebel territory. He quotes Lincoln in the Lincoln-Douglas debate saying, I'm not or ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. And he goes on and on. That, you, know, you have to just believe a bunch of nonsense to believe the treasury of virtue story. And that's what Americans believe. So what did the U.S. government do with this treasury of virtue? I believe this is true, and especially after Lincoln was assassinated. He was deified by the Republican Party and the New England clergy who worked hand in hand with the Republican Party. And that led to the deification of the presidency, you know, more or less, and, and the government itself. So this treasury of virtue, I think, is a very important idea. So what did the U.S. government commence doing with all of this virtue? Well, three months after the war was over, this is the war to prevent Southern independence, Sherman was put in charge of the military district of the Missouri, which is all land west of the Mississippi, and they commenced a 25-year war of genocide against the Plains Indians. Uh, General Sherman himself said, we're not going to let a few thieving, ragged Indians check and stop the progress of the railroads. That was the purpose, the main purpose of the, the government-subsidized transcontinental railroads. Uh, uh, Mike, Michael Sherman, a, a biographer of Sherman, said the great triumvirate of the Civil War effort, Generals Grant, Sherman, and Sheridan, and pursued what Sherman called the final solution to the Indian problem. When I first read, and he quotes, he's quoting Sherman as saying that. This is not Michael Fellman, this is Sherman. When I read that, I said, well, that's kind of spooky, isn't it? The final solution to the Indian problem. And Fellman goes on, and he said that, um, he quotes uh, Sherman as saying, what he was trying to achieve was, quote, a racial cleansing of the land. Uh, Sherman said, all the Indians will have to be killed or maintained as a species of paupers and be obliterated or beg for mercy. And he gave Sherman, uh, quote, prior authorization to slaughter as many men, women and children as well as men when attacking villages because it would be too time consuming to sort them out, as Sherman, Sherman said. So that went on. This is a period of time where these Indian villages were pretty primitive, and the U.S. US Army had uh, Gatlin guns and cannon, rifled cannon and, and so forth. Okay? And so that's the first thing they did with all this, um, this uh, virtue that the Civil War created. Uh, another thing is the, the Philippine insurrection. The Filipinos had just finally kicked out the Spaniards and, uh, and the, and, but the Americans, the U.S. government, wanted the Philippines to be their colony. They were no longer a Spanish colony, but uh, the U.S. government wanted them to be their colony. And so the Philippine insurrection was an insurrection against the U.S. government trying to take over the Philippines. And uh, if you do a little digging, you'll, you'll find that the historians say that some 200,000 Filipinos were killed by American soldiers during this time, although I found one historian said it might have been as many as a million, so they don't seem to know, but most of them seem to think it was 200,000. And Teddy Roosevelt, uh, uh, at the time, uh, was supporting this, you know, making speeches about this. He, he, he denounced the Filipinos as, and I'm quoting Teddy Roosevelt, Chinese half-breeds, savages, barbarians, a wild and ignorant people. So there's the, you know, the demonization, the dehumanization of the Filipinos. A U.S. senator called Albert Beveridge of Indiana said, the Philippines are ours forever. The Pacific Ocean is ours. He's bragging about this. And, uh, and he called them a savage and senile people. Senator Bill Tillman, the U.S. Senator Bill Till Tillman, 
uh, said these people are people racially unfit to govern themselves. Uh, the other Senator Beveridge, he said that uh, it was America's duty to bring Christianity and civilization to a savage and senile people. Well, the Filipinos had been Catholics for about 400 years at that point, so they, they didn't need to have Christianity brought, brought to them. Um, Jim Powell is a friend of mine, you know, Jim Powell. He wrote a book on Teddy Roosevelt, and, uh, and he quotes uh, Teddy about the Filipinos as, uh, as uh, talking about what he called the menace of peace. And afterwards, right shortly afterwards, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and Teddy himself plotted against Cuba, Hawaii, Venezuela, China, Panama, Chile, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, and Canada. When you've got a treasury of virtue, you can be the bully of the planet. Uh, because whatever you do is virtuous by the fact that it is you doing it. That's, that's what Robert Penn Warren uh, said about that. This was, of course, followed by the, the uh, month long, three month long Spanish American War. And, uh, you, and I recommend the great e the essay by uh, William Graham Sumner, The Conquest of the United States by Spain, uh, where, where he talks about how we became, we became an empire like the Spanish Empire by, by getting involved in this. Okay. And so. And so these are some of the things that were done, uh, you know, with this, all this virtue. One more example I'll give is uh, the conquest and subjugation of Hawaii that happened. Uh, the American, American corporations that wanted to get in, take over the pineapple industry got, got, uh, got the army to go into Hawaii. And their constitution is known as the, uh, the new constitution that was adopted yeah, around the, you know, this time, the 19th century, it was called the Bayonet Constitution. Uh, the government uh, appointed a man named Judge Sanford Dole as the head of the new puppet government in Hawaii. And they sent a paramilitary organization called the Honolulu Rifles who literally forced the Hawaiian king at, at Bayonet Point to sign a constitution. Just like that scene in the Godfather movie where, the, where, they, where, where the, uh, the head of the mafia says, either your brains or your signature will be on this contract. It was, just, it was literally what they did. Uh, and so, of course, they signed this. He signed the, the Constitution that disenfranchised all Asians as, quote, an inferior race, along, along with uh, native Hawaiians and, uh, and, um, and, of course, and of course, the uh, uh, wealthy American landowners uh, were the only ones left with the right to vote in, in Hawaii in that day. And this was 22 years after the end of the Civil War, the American Civil War, the, you know, the war for racial purity that, uh, that uh, was waged by, by the North. And so Judge Dole was the head of this new government. And by mere coincidence, I'm sure, his cousin, James Dole, uh, then founded the Dole Fruit Company in, in Hawaii. So that was another good example of the use of all this, this virtue by the U.S. government uh, uh, shortly after it, it created the Treasury of Virtue. Teddy Roosevelt, again, you know, he's, I call him the, he was sort of the, the biggest blowhard in American political history, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Tom Woods once said that he thought the only reason why the media liked him so much and gave him so much good press is they liked his giant teeth. He had big teeth, and they just like to take pictures of him with the big teeth, like horse teeth, with Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> I should have had a picture of Teddy and his teeth. <clears throat> one true story about Teddy Roosevelt. When he was president, he was found one morning at daybreak uh, uh, grappling across the Potomac River on a wire. And someone asked him, what on earth did you do that for? And he said, I thought I needed to strengthen my wrists. So it's kind of a, I don't know. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt. Here's what he said in 1895 about Hawaii. I feel that it was a crime against the white race that we did not annex Hawaii three years ago. That's Teddy. Okay, so so these, are, these are the things that this treasury virtue uh, gave us, and of course, you go throughout American history after that, World War I, 
World War II, the, the idea of unconditional surrender. Well, where does that come from? It's, 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 I think, in my view, it's this idea of treasury of virtue. If you fa fast forward all the way to uh, almost present day, during the, the second Bush administration, an article that I wrote about on Lou's, Lou's website it was uh, uh, Newt Gingrich wrote an article entitled Lincoln and Bush. And in it, he advocated an American military invasion of Lydia, Libya, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iran, and, uh, and one or two other Middle Eastern countries. And the Lincoln and Bush was the, the title of the article was because he's saying this is what Lincoln would do. If, if Lincoln was advising George W. Bush, that's, that's, that's what he would do. And, and so and even Mubarak, the former dictator of Pakistan, when he imposed martial law in his country, he quoted Abe Lincoln as saying, well, Lincoln did it, so it has to be virtuous. And so even, so even foreigners are start trying to you know, adopt this treasury of virtue idea attached to the American political history to, to ju justify tyranny in their countries. And so, you know, so what is the, uh, you know, the connection between uh, the dollar decline and all of this is that I think, uh, you know, what's going on now is that I think this treasury of virtue has pretty much run its course. Um, uh, Naomi Wolf describes uh, the current resident in the White House as a, a senile puppet run by the Chinese Communist Party. That's what, that's what Naomi Wolf calls. And, uh, and it seems like the, the primary goal of the U.S. government today is to be in bed with the Nazis who run the uh, Ukrainian government. And so how, much, how virtuous can that be? And that's a good thing uh, because this undermines the whole use of sanctions and, and being the bully of the world, in, in my view. And, and, uh, and we, need, we need to ramp up the production of those bumper stickers that, that say, uh, do as we say, or we will bring democracy to your country. Because I think humor and lampooning these people can be very effective, and they and they, they well deserve it, don't they? And so, uh, and I think my time is about up. Somebody just held a card that said, "Get off the stage." So. so.